Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Alhamdulillah. Wassalatu wassalamu ala Rasulillah wa ala ahli wa sahbihi wa bawala. Abasyarah li sadri wa yasir li amri wa hulul aqbata min lisani yafqahu qawli. Ladies and gentlemen, fellow viewers, welcome to our uh, session tonight. Uh, the discourse on Makhos di Syariah uh, with uh, Makhos in Malaysia. So uh, tonight uh, we will be discussing on a very important topic, which is the application of the Mafasid methodology in some uh, practical research uh, work. So uh, tonight we have Dr. Yahya, Dr. Baptist uh, uh, with us today. Um, maybe before uh, we begin, I would like to uh, introduce you to our speaker for tonight. Dr. Baptist or Dr. Yahya is a senior fellow at the Makhosid Institute uh, Global. He, ho he holds a PhD uh, in religious studies from the uh, University of Freiburg, Switzerland. Uh, he and he is actually from Switzerland. Uh, he prepared an inter interdisciplinary thesis entitled Islamic Social Work in Switzerland, which combines sociology, religious studies, and theology. Uh, previously, uh, he obtained a bachelor degree in political science in Paris and master master's uh, degree in social science in uh, Freiburg, uh, Switzerland, and work uh, in the field of development, education, counseling, and social work. He was uh, particularly involved in social work uh, in prison and also uh, in humanitarian aid. In par parallel, uh, he also has traveled to more than 50 countries in order to meet various Muslim com communities and to study contemporary Islamic movements all over the world. His interest is focused on social problems and social work, grassroots humanitarian aid, con contemporary uh, Islamic movements uh, in non-Muslim countries, uh, faith-based uh, social activism and da'wah in Europe and Latin America. Uh, he wrote several articles on subjects related to Muslim communities in, West, in the West and also their contribution to the society in the field of social work. So before I begin, maybe some introduction from me uh, regarding uh, Prof. Jasir Auda, uh, Prof. Jasir's work. Uh, Prof. Jasir Auda's work entitled Re-envisioning Re Islamic Scholarship, Makhosid Methodology as a New Approach, uh, was, uh, I think, uh, uh, in Malaysia uh, in last year represent another uh, landmark or another approach to the fundamental uh, and practical aspect of uh, the democracy itself. So the project seeks to revitalize the concept of fiqh as a multidisciplinary tradition uh, capable of significantly uh, catering to the current uh, social uh, needs and issues. And, and I think it also aims to propose uh, solutions to the problems in the mainstream approach to the democracy, which uh, Prof. Yasir mentioned about imitation, uh, partialism, apologism, <coughs> deconstruction. So in doing so, uh, Prof. Yasir introduces a procedure known, known uh, as cycles of reflection uh, on the reveal text of the Quran and Sunnah as a means uh, in developing a critique uh, on the dominant perspective of uh, our natural and social, social economic uh, realities. So this particular procedure is required in order to extract uh, several components from the rebel sources, including concept, objective, values, values uh, commands, universal, law, universal laws, groups, and so. So fortunately, our speaker for tonight is the one who has uh, the experience in applying uh, this particular method and teaching it uh, to some postgraduate uh, student at the Peace University, Cape Town, South Africa. So tonight, uh, he will be sharing with us examples of application of the Makhosid methodology uh, in some practical uh, instances. So without further ado, uh, I would like uh, to well, uh, invite our speaker tonight, uh, Dr. Yahya. Before that, um, uh, we have participants in our Zoom session and, our, and also uh, viewers in our uh, Facebook Live. So if you would like to uh, ask questions, 
you can ask after uh, 45 minutes presentation by Dr. Yahya uh, and, and post your question in our chat uh, uh, section and also the comment section in uh, the FB. So without further ado, over to you, Dr. Yahya. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Salatu wassalamu ala Sayyidina Muhammad. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, thanks a lot. Jazakallah khair, Dr. Badri. I'm very happy to be here with you and uh, many thanks for the introduction. Uh, I try to speak about the application of the Maqasid methodology today, but I insist on the fact that it will be very based on application, not so much theory. And uh, we'll try to see together how concretely we can make this application a bit simple, a bit easy for all of us in our respective fields. Although the method itself is very challenging, it's very deep. So the challenge we have is to bring something which is uh, presented in this book that you have the three, more than 300 pages in the book that speaks about the method in a very deep way, very, with a lot of details, examples, and that gives a much a sound, a sounder understanding of it, of course. But for me, my aim to tonight is to try to show that it's still possible to make it easy and to begin with something, and then we can build on it like we built puzzle piece by piece, brick by brick, and all together we can do something in line with this Maqasid approach, but not in necessarily a very complex way. And that's why I want to, to, to show you tonight with concrete examples. So I'm very happy to be here and please ask your questions because the, the main purpose of such a presentation is to debate, to share experiences and also to uh, respond to some comments and questions you may have. So I will try even to keep um, shorter than 45 minutes, maybe if it's possible, in order to let more space for questions at the end. Uh, let me share a uh, PowerPoint presentation, which is a bit uh, short, but it, it will uh, give some general basis, maybe that we, we can discuss together. So, Bismillah, here. Can you see it? Yes, yes. Thank you. So first of all, when we talk about the Maqasid approach uh, uh, from an Islamic perspective, for the perspective of a believer, is not just for the sake of knowledge, uh, it's not just for uh, debating or discussing an intellectual matter, but mostly it's because we trust we have a responsibility in the society and that we want to bring something to Muslims and non-Muslims, to the whole humanity and to society. So the purpose of the Maqasid approach is to develop a new way to understand Islam. I, I shouldn't say a new way because the, the way was here, here far um, beyond us, far behind our, our specific time we live in, but Somehow we can use the, the adjective new because we don't witness many organizations implementing such an approach today. That's why we say new, but of course it's not new because it's also embedded in, in the revelation in itself. And we'll try to see how. So we want to use this Makasid approach in order to try to improve our situation as humans, as Muslims, or as um, uh, Malaysian, for instance, as people uh, within our family, within our community, and within our society in the broader way. It has to lead, finally, eventually, to social change in light of Islamic teachings, which means, as in the perspective of believers, we believe that the revelation encompasses some solutions for our life and so some solutions to be applied in our routine, in our way to, to treat each other, in our way to understand our role in, on earth. And all that understanding has to lead to action. It's very important here. So we, we have mainly three aspects in this worldview. 
Well, the first aspect is knowledge. It's about res doing research. It's about understanding things. Of course, it's, it's very uh, easy to understand why. Then we have another aspect which is linked to education. We want to inspire people too. If we learn something from us, it won't be useful till we share with others what we learned. And the third dimension here is action, intervention, in which condition we bring knowledge to drive to social change. It's very important here. We don't want just abstract knowledge, but we want to find some resources in Quran, in Sunnah, in order to use that in our society and drive to social change for the benefits of humans. That's basically the three main aspects we have, which cannot be uh, divided. So we can uh, expose them like um, three different models, of course, but it has to be understood in a circular way, like a circle, uh, like every of these aspects nourish the other aspect, and they are interconnected, of course. No, why, uh, why Makassi approach applied to social research or to field research? Um, I think we have to start from some observations that many of us can do in our daily life. We can see, first of all, that we, we have a huge gap, according to the societies, of course, it may differ from one country to another country, but generally speaking, we found a deep gap between the ideal Islamic society or what Islam teaches and our concrete reality, even in a Muslim country. But let's talk even of non-Muslim societies and so. You have the Islamic values, ideals, and then you have the sad, often sad reality of Muslims or not Muslims. And there's a gap in between. So we witnessed today that we still have a lot of contemporary issues, such as, for instance, drug addiction can be mental health issues, even suicides, um, which are quite extreme cases, maybe, but also you have other issues which are more widespread, like uh, uh, troubles in marriage, um, celibacy, um, social, what I call intellectual schizophrenia, meaning that a lot of Muslims, they have on the one hand their faith, on the other hand, they have their uh, modern education and they don't find a way to combine both. And it can drive to many doubts, many internal um, difficulty to bear with our world in uh, constant uh, evolution. Also, we, we have uh, a new ways of um, issues, like they are, they, are, they are introduced as gender issues, for instance, uh, in non-Muslim societies, you have the assisted suicide, uh, euthanasia, and new um, problems that push Muslims to think about what Islam teaches them. Uh, how can traditional Islamic scholarship address these issues? For most of these cases, it's very new, it's very linked to our contemporary context. And if we just look at the uh, fiqh uh, opinions of before, we won't necessarily find some uh, accurate opinions, or accurate solutions in this text because the society always change. And what happened in our daily life now, it's not what happened even 20 or 30 years ago. So it's, it's very important to keep moving in a constant uh, intellectual reflection in line with Islamic teaching. Uh, that's one thing. But another thing also, which comes from observation, is that we see a lot of organizations label themselves as Islamic. You have Islamic projects, Islamic NGOs, Islamic organization doing uh, humanitarian work, Dawa projects, whatever. But are they really Islamic in their um, fundamentals and principles? Or are they, or is this, is this just a level? Is this just an identity? Or are their projects really inspired by the Islamic faith? And I think that's a crucial question to ask now. So when we take all these aspects together, 
we may find that the Marcassid methodology proposed a new way somehow to go back to the roots, to the roots of revealed knowledge from the Quran and Sunnah in order to extract some guidelines, some principles, some real, uh, I mean, uh, some uh, genuine Islamic values, principles, and guidelines that can be um, uh, implemented in concrete projects to solve these issues. That, that's the intention, first of all. Then, um, it, maybe it, it, it seems abstract, and the idea of today is to get rid of this abstraction and to go to very concrete things. So we, we, we may start by showing the steps on how a Muslim in his whole field, it can be a medical doctor, he or or she can be a psychologist, sociologist, uh, whoever. Everybody of us, even if we are not academic, we have a field of expertise. Somehow we have knowledge, we have experience, and we can take advantage of the Maqasid methodology to apply in the fields we have skills, in the fields we have expertise in. And the first thing to do, of course, when we uh, try to begin with uh, a project is to define the purpose, the issue. And that's up to the individuals who want to implement this Maqasid methodology. For instance, for some people, they will find that the homelessness is a big issue and that um, they have to do something uh, against that. For other people, they want to develop uh, Islamic understanding of health and medicine. They may think the, the, the mainstream medicine is not in line with Islamic teachings, is not in line with human interest. Let's develop uh, Islamic understanding of medicine. So that would be a purpose. So we, we have so many possible purposes who have to be in line with the Quran and who has to be reflected according to the needs of people and society. But that's, that said, we will we'll try to, to take a, a few concrete examples later. But when we have a purpose, then the first step I propose to do is to assess reality, to understand what happens in society concretely. Not what we want, but what really happens. That's point, point one. Point two, Understanding the teachings of Islam and the subject we, we picked up. For instance, what Revelation teaches us about medicine, about health, or what Quran and Sunnah teaches us about poverty and about our responsibility to tackle poverty, for instance. That's point two. Point three, find ways to lead to social change. Because before we said we don't want to, to stay just at the level of uh, intellectual reflection, research, or even education, but also we need action. So all these steps go together, and it's a process we have at our humble scale to try to, to start with. Then to, to go in the, into more details, for instance, um, when we want to understand the reality, we mean analytic research. We mean not normative. We'll show the, the difference. It's the very basic, basics, but I think it has to be um, underlined. It has to be highlighted because of the fundamentals, it's what we need to start something. And then if the fundamentals are acquired, we, you, we can go more in depth in the methodology, for instance, for those who are interested by, by the book. But it's interesting to, understand first the main general holistic approach. So let's take the, the problem of drug consumption. For instance, uh, someone lives in uh, Zanzibar, Tanzania, and it witness there is a problem of heroin addiction uh, concerning even Muslims. So you have to understand the reality first, which is embedded in the context. So it needs a few steps like literature reviews, because some people may have worked on the topic before, consulting experts who know about the situation, but also field research. Often the field research is very important because 
we want the understanding of the problem to be contextualized within a particular time and within a particular uh, space, space and time. And it always changed. So what's true about KL in 2022 was, is not the, the, what happened here 10 years ago. So if somebody did a research about KL uh, homelessness 10 years ago, and now it's a totally different problem. And we need this kind of research for that. Because the goal here at that point A is to lead to a sound understanding on concrete issues. I insist on that because today you have so many NGOs, uh, Muslim or non-Muslim, whatever, so many NGOs uh, worldwide trying to bring solutions, trying to bring social change. But often they failed to understand real issues. If we fail that step, it's very difficult to have positive influence then. But sometimes we, we take it for granted, oh, okay, we understand what happens. But we cannot understand without taking time to do research, to, to try to think properly on the, the subject. So that's point A. Uh, then we have to do a distinction, which is uh, quite basic for, for most of us, but maybe we can recall that very quickly. There's a distinction between analytic and normative and uh, some people, some of my previous students, for instance, in South Africa, they were very confused about the difference between both because it was an Islamic institution, but at the same time, they try to promote a Western academia way of doing research. And in, on the one hand, we want to be analytic in terms of understanding the society as it is. So here, analytic means to assess reality, understanding as it is, not as it should be. First, we have to understand as it is. It's a, what we call most very broadly sociological perspective and with the need to go to the field. But that said, at the same time, as Muslims, not only Muslims, but as Muslims, we have these normative also approach, which means that we want to know society not as it is, but also as it should be. So normative, what should be doing? What, how the society should look like? And here, it's very important to go back to Islamic teachings when uh, we are Muslims, of course, and to go back to the Quran and um, a revelation to identify guidelines and teachings. To, we, we, want, we want to identify these principles directly from the revelation, and which allow us finally to envision and to foresee an ideal solution. And then when we have A and B, then we can think about transformative purpose. So all the presentation today will be about that about how we navigate between A and B, about the analytical way and the normative uh, dimension. Um, so let, let me skip into the B side, into the normative approach. Of course, I, I can't uh, summarize now the Makassid methodology. Uh, again, it's in this book and in other books of our Sheikh Professor uh, Jasser Auda. But uh, I just want to bring very simple elements of that methodology to show as even uh, laymen, we can take advantage of that. We can find interest and useful tools in the methodology, even at a simple level. So. Maqsid al maqasid in plural, it means higher purpose intent of the revelation. So it's a teleological um, based approach, which is interesting on the finality or aim or end or goal of the revelation. For instance, in the Quran, we find that in the Quran, many verses are constructed like that. So Allah tell the Muslims what they have to do, or tell the human beings what they have to do, but also the rules may be attached to some consequences. 
to some uh, aims, purpose. For instance, you, we have here a very simple verse, well-known verse, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. So it's like all people, all people worship uh, your God uh, who created you and created who were before you in order so that they attain the state of taqwa. Very interesting. Because here, ibadah is linked to the idea of taqwa. Then we, we, we can think about what taqwa means. Also, also we, we have another verse with the same kind of idea. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Ya ayu al-ladhina amanu kutib alaykum usiyamu kama kutib ala al-ladhina min qablikum la'allakum tattaqoon. So same logic here. There is an injunction, a rule, which is linked to an effect, to a purpose, to something that is expected of that practice. Roshiv here, Ibadah is related to the acquisition of taqwa. Hatefulness, righteousness, it's translated like that in English often. But now we, we can see the next um, slide. So we see that the, sorry, we see that here, how we do to reflect on the Quran and Sunnah, first we have to understand that some, there are some intents, some higher purpose, some maqasid behind rules in Islam. It's very important to understand that logic, which is Quranic by itself. But then uh, a very important approach that is promoted by the maqasid methodology is to take a holistic approach a holistic reading and not the partialistic. We have to consider all the scriptures, Quran and Sunnah, on one specific subject. For instance, also it helps us to understand the concept. What taqwa encompass? How do we know what is taqwa? We know what is taqwa when we collect all the verses, ayat al-Quran, and all the hadith about this concept of taqwa. It, it, it will shape a holistic understanding on it, and it will help us to resolve the apparent contradictions between the texts. Because some people may find contradiction in Quran and Sunnah, but there is no contradiction for us. It's just that there is context which change the specific understanding of a concept according to its situation, according to its environment. So when we gather in a holistic approach, all um, the elements about one concept, it gives a um, very holistic understanding of it, which gives meaning to that. And then we can understand what is taqwa if we take all the verses and uh, occurrences in Sunnah talking about the, the taqwa, it becomes much clearer for us. Uh, this process of reflection, tadabbur, leads finally, eventually, to an Islamic framework inspired or in line with the revolution. So we can use that in specific purpose too. For instance, you take the social issue as, as drug consumption, like um, the intoxicant, and going back to Quran and Sunnah, you can find out what is the Islamic view on that or even what's the Islamic view on neoliberalism. Even if neoliberalism is not quoted in the Quran, if you find out the referred concepts regarding to the financial economic systems in Quran and Sunnah, you will be able to build an Islamic framework on that, that lately you can apply to the, the issue or the purpose you want to address. If same thing for Islamic psychology, Islamic medicine. What does it mean? For knowing that, we need to understand the Islamic view on medicine, Islamic view on health, Islamic view on psychology, for instance. And for doing that, we need this holistic approach, taking all the elements in the Quran and Sunnah about one specific subject we uh, selected according to our need. 
Um, so that's the methodology in brief. Of course, we don't have time to go more in, in, in detail, but my message here is that even at our humble level, if we try to take the Quran and Sunnah as a holistic message, then it becomes much easier to find meaning, to extract the mainstream Islamic meaning of what specific purpose and aspect. And also we have to keep in mind this theological dimension of the scriptures, that the rules often they are associated with an intent, with a purpose, with maqsid. Then uh, let's take the, to see how, it's, how this whole process applies. Let's, let's, let's take the, the example, for instance, of uh, NGOs, Islamic humanitarian NGOs. So we, we see these last years, these last decades, more and more uh, Muslim NGOs, they try to do social work, humanitarian aid in various countries, and they provide, for instance, social services, food, clothes, counseling, financial support, even meditation. And uh, also some of them, they engage in dawah. They try to spread Islam at the same time. Uh, so they are labeled often as Islamic NGO. But when we look at them and when we conduct interviews on the field, we try to understand what makes them Islamic. And often we see it's just a label. It's just, it's just an identity instead of a reference uh, based on principles, values, or Islamic proper methodology to understand that. That's, that's um, observation we often make on the field, first of all. Then we realize there's a problem with this label Islamic because many people will call things Islamic just because you have a very superficial uh, varnish uh, on the things, but it's not Islamic in its core. It's not Islamic in its values. And that's very problematic, actually. So um, how to deal with that, with the Maqasid methodology? We go back to our steps. First, we have to begin with the critical studies of reality, assessing reality. So for instance, if I'm interested in humanitarian work and I'm interested in the Islamic message about that, I must begin to see what happens concretely. What are the social issues I'm interested in? What are the participation of so-called Islamic NGOs against these issues? And this is a very sociological approach, which means we want to assess reality as it is. So first observation, for instance, we see that so-called Islamic NGOs, grassroots organizations do deliver social services and humanitarian aid in the name of Islam. That's a fact, that's a fact. They, they do things and they claim to do it in the name of Islam. But now for the research, I want to assess reality to understand what happens concretely and I will go into the field with the questions, why do they do this? How do they do this? Why and how, for instance? Then based on that, I will have my, you know, you can write a PhD, you can write a paper, whatever, or even a document with some elements. You understood what happens in the field. That's first, first step, let's say, assessing reality. Then, in parallel, you can go back to the revelation, Quran, Sunnah, and you try to understand what are the Islamic guidelines on that. So to discuss how Islamic teachings can shape a suitable practice of social work and humanitarian aid, and what's correct in terms of Islamic way of doing it. That's two different things in parallel. One is analytic, the other one is normative. When you have these two steps done, you can think, how do we change? How do we lead to social change? What can we do to address the, 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 the common issues? The gap between reality and between normative Islamic principles we would like to apply. That's in brief, that's the way we, we work with that. Uh, how many minutes do I have left? I, I don't think... I, this is what I've seen. Uh, this is the same thing, basically, what I've explained, how we do critical studies of literature 
literature and reality, uh, for instance, about Islamic observation, uh, so-called Islamic organizations doing social work, humanitarian aid. Uh, you can have observations that I did myself here. I don't want to go in the details, but that's assessing reality. That's what happens concretely in society. That's not what we want as a Muslims. That's what we witness actually. That's done. Then we said uh, same thing. Why they do that? How they do that? It's just assessing. It's not about what I feel. It's not about what I want. It's about what I research. What's the outcome of my research? Uh, same here. Same here. We don't have time to go in detail. But that's doing the second part is know that I know what happens in the field. Is it in line with the revelation? Is it in line with Islamic principles or not? So in order to, to know that, I will look at the revelation, Quran, Sunnah, what the revelation teaches us to do in those concrete uh, issues. So the aim here is to redefine social work and aid practice in line with Islamic principles. And you will do that reading Quran, going back to the Sunnah, reflecting, and again, trying to take the holistic approach. So trying to identify, identifying all the verses uh, on a specific subject, like uh, infaq, like zakat, like different things. Then you, you will have concepts just an example, it's a partial example, it's not uh, uh, holistic here, but you find concept as the sacredness of human beings in the Quran, uh, unconditional nature of aid in the Quran to impartiality, rahmah, uh, wanting for the others what we love for ourselves. Hadith, for instance. And you, you have a general idea of the Islamic message on that. Also, you apply that on the why. Why should we help? And how should we do? And the response is in the Quran and Sunnah. And then you, you will build on a draft, build on a general uh, vision of the Islamic view on charity work, for instance. And here I have an example uh, very easy to do also, you know, you, you just pick up a concept, like infaq. Allah said in the Quran that we have to do infaq, for instance, giving wealth. Uh, we find this injunction a lot of times. So we want to understand the Islamic perspective on it. So I ask questions, to whom do we give? Why do we give? How do we give? According to the Quran. And here with this mind mapping, you will find many verses. So I, I put, for instance, two is Surat Baqarah, 273, and so, and so, and so. But there are much more verses. It's just an example. Then you have, you built on this slowly, slowly, like a puzzle, like bricks you put to, to build your, your house, and you get a better understanding of the holistic uh, Islamic vision on poverty and uh, uh, infaq and so on. So you, are, you have the response to what we, you want to know, to whom, why, who we do that. And then you, you find out also that there are concepts with, which are related to the question, concepts which are related to the issue. For instance, you have in the Maqasid, you have the seeking the love from uh, Allah. You have the concept of taqwa, you have the concept of rahmah, you have also the concept of akhira, that this, what we do in this life is to prepare the next one. And so, so that, that has to be linked with the subject. Also, you have the concept of wasting, wasting being haram, and the concept of qana'a, and the concept of sobriety. So you can build uh, a view which is not uh, exhaustive, First, it takes time, but it's, it, it shows you some correlates. It shows you a holistic approach because the Quran explains itself and Sunnah is the implementation of the Quran. So you found out in a circular way that there are so many elements to give us a proper understanding of what is the 
the conditions, the, 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 the definition of welfare service according to the Quran, for instance. That's just an example. Right? And you can apply the same thing with mind mapping to uh, any of your fields according to what you want to achieve. Then I think I arrived at the, to the, almost to the end of my time. So this, this was just a very humble attempt to show you that the method in itself, it's simple. I mean, it's, it takes a long time to apply, but it's simple in its fundamentals. Its fundamentals for me are twofold. Assessing reality and understanding the Islamic principles, the maqasid to be implemented in that reality in order to lead to social change. So that, that's two things in parallel. Going back to the field, there are today so many Islamic organizations. They do a lot of work. Some of them do so interesting work. And at least they will work. But also sometimes when you visit them, that work project in Latin America, for instance, or humanitarian project in West Africa, in Europe, wherever you want, you feel that there was no reflection about Islam in their strategy. And often or sometimes they even do the opposite of the Islamic teachings. They are very confused. So that shows us that knowledge is very important. Action is very central, of course, in Islam. But action without knowledge is dangerous. Whereas also knowledge without action is also dangerous for us because we, the life is short and we have responsibility. In front of Allah, we have responsibility to do our best to help humankind, the, the human being, and to help Muslims uh, and to help our society, our communities, our family. That's very important to connect both these knowledge and practice. Um, again, often we see that a partialistic approach can be dangerous and the holistic approach is a duty to respond to, to these mistakes that have been done in the name of Islam uh, for the last decades or the last years in, in, in many contexts. Because taking a verse in isolation, uh, just hadith, it doesn't provide us with a sound understanding of the message of Islam. It's very important to go back to the Quran and Sunnah as a whole. And in, in this regard, again, again the Maqasid methodology provides some tools or, and a sound methodology to identify purpose behind the Quran revelation and a hadith to understand also our role in this society and what can be done. And uh, I, I hope there are comments or questions because I, I, I don't want to be more uh, to longer. So thanks a lot for being here. And uh, excuse me, I'm sorry for my shortcomings. Jazakum wa khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Jazakum wa khair, Dr. Yahya. Thank you very much for your interesting presentation on the practical application of the Makhasid methodology in your experience of teaching some post-graduate students and your own experience of assessing uh, the, the, the Muslim uh, movements uh, all over the world. So maybe uh, uh, we have participants in uh, the Zoom session and some viewers in the Facebook session. Uh, you may ask or post your question in the chat uh, section or the comment section in the uh, uh, FB Live. So uh, there are three questions as of now. Maybe I can read it to you. <coughs> the first one would be uh, the, uh, a question uh, from the Zoom session. Can the Makhasid methodology uh, be used to decide a law or hukum or maybe to create a new fatwa? Uh, do you like to respond to it first or you want to, uh, to for me to read another question? Uh, maybe uh, I take all of them, maybe because sometimes it repeats some elements. Uh, okay. If there are three, it's okay. Yeah. So the, that is the first one. Um, the second one, uh, which one is the more difficult uh, part or more challenging part 
to conduct uh, the Makosid methodology based research, is it the analytical aspect or the normative aspect? And second one, uh, the third one is the question I think is for me myself. Uh, I think there are different approach to realize the realities, as you mentioned, especially, especially on the analytic part of it. So there are different approaches. Uh, or in other words, there are differences in research methods. Um, and regarding this research method, there are critiques uh, on the quantitative approach, uh, particularly uh, in, the, in, the, in the course of assessing social realities. Mm -hmm. So you know in, in quantitative aspect, you can quantify certain things, but there are more there are more aspects in the social uh, you know, uh, realms or social spheres that you cannot be quantified. Uh, for, for instance, values and so on and so forth. So to apply this quantitative aspect in analyzing social uh, phenomena, uh, it uh, you know, uh, could uh, tantamount to you know, uh, resorting to reductionism uh, or reductionistic um, approach uh, I think an, uh, an, an, uh, uh, an approach that uh, the Makosid methodology wants to critique uh, you know, the, 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 the approach. So uh, what do you think of this, uh, this uh, matter, Dr. Yahya? So I think the, uh, as of now, there are the questions for you. Yeah. Uh, terima kasih. Jazakum al khair. Thanks. Uh, very interesting question. I try to respond quickly, though, because of the time, but it, it's very valuable questions. We can reflect a, a lot on that. And uh, regarding your last question, Dr. Badri, I, I think it's a very good point. And I think also it requires scholarship in our specific fields. And uh, as for mine, what I'm trying to do is uh, in the field of sociology and anthropology. And of course, there is both qualitative and quantitative approach. But even within the approach, there is so many ways to, to carry on uh, research. And if the goal, of course, in this research is to try to get as close as duality as possible. We never encompass the whole reality and we have to keep a humble on that, especially in the field of uh, human sciences, but even in the, the, the other sciences, we never know everything, but it's an attempt to understand better our society. That said, there are a lot of common mistakes uh, of bias we can get in, in conducting such quantitative, also qualitative uh, which is research studies. And I would say to respond to, to your comment, uh, uh, it, it's very important to be aware also, not only on the results, but on the way we're doing research. And that means to be aware of epistemological foundations of knowledge, also ethical uh, conditions of getting to the field or interacting with people. And that is not very easy because here we will go maybe to the more, again, to the normative uh, dimension. So for the sake of being uh, clear or easygoing with that, I, I, try, I tend to separate the, the analytical part and the normative part and so, but analytic part also encompass the need to be aware of the epistemologies behind knowledge about the conditions of the method and so, and it can be very dangerous because many people can go into the, into the field and get back with the results, but the, the results are based. Maybe they are all wrong. And then they will carry out projects based on that, on those wrong, uh, wrong assumptions. Meaning that all the steps require a scholarship. And if, if you are a sociologist, you may want to, investigate and to question more in depth all these dimensions of epistemology of knowledge and then uh, of uh, ethics and methodology 
and, and you can be very critical against the only quantitative approach and promote also a more qualitative way to understand the reality in order to uh, extract some data which are not not less biased on the, 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 the most accurate we can. But still, we, we still have to be able and to understand that our understanding is limited. But that's a very good point because I think here we go to very um, problematic matter in all the fields. Because in all the fields, it's a circular uh, journey. For instance, first I speak about analytic. We want to be objective, so-called objective. Because objectivity is not here, but we want that. Then we go to the normative because we believe in the revolution. We believe in wahi, but at the same time, the fact we believe in wahi gives us some assumptions about the discipline itself. So it allows us to understand the psychological in one way. So both will communicate. It's why it's very cycle uh, progress. Uh, which has to be started somewhere. That's why I, I, I tried to keep it uh, quite easy, quite, um, um, how to say that, quite schematical, but then we, we have to build on that and to increase the levels of complexity. And when we increase the levels of complexity, uh, we'll see that even the way we assess reality is very influenced by our assumptions and by our uh, normative uh, references somehow. So I think that your equation uh, should be explored more in depth, but I'm sorry for the, the short answer. And the, the, the second one, what's more difficult between uh, assessing reality and between a normative reflection of what are the Islamic teachings? I think, of course, it depends on the field, it depends on the purpose, it depends on the subject you want to investigate. But within my field, I will maybe uh, I will maybe you know make some of you confused. But I would say that assessing reality maybe it, it's like ninety percent of the effort. And going back to Quran and Sunnah will be just ten percent. Why? Because assessing reality is very important, and it always changes. It requires quite a lot, long time to go in the field to understand things and so on. So, uh, which we, when we are in that field, we love it so we can do it, you know? That's why I believe that everybody has to work according to what he is good at, what he wants to achieve. Then when I get this assessment of reality of uh, NGOs, whatever, I can go back to the Quran and very quickly, I will find contradiction between Quranic values and concrete practices very quickly. So even with my poor understanding of Quran and Sunnah, still I'm able with the, let's take this, uh, SubhanAllah, uh, let me share again, one minute. Yeah. Let's take the, the, this mind mapping. Uh, maybe it takes uh, an hour to, to, to do that, you know? I don't know how, many, how much time, but it's not long. It's very simple somehow. It, it's, you go in the Quran or what we know of the Quran and you find that Allah talks about welfare and infaq and so, and it's quite explicit. And just with a, a beginning of reflection of Quran, I, I say a beginning, I say it is not complete, of course. Even with that, you can bring so much added value because with that you will go back to the field you'll go back to the NGOs and try to teach them and say listen we are Muslims we believe in the revelation so when you feed the homeless for instance it has to be done unconditionally without expecting nothing because of the ayat in Surat, surat Al-Insan for instance which speaks about that and you have evidence so I would say uh, it depends the field, but assessing reality is, is very needed. Reflection on Quran and Sunnah also, but in my own field, uh, which is social sciences, it's the way I process. In the field of usuli, you know, uh, usul al-fiqh and so, 
of course, that will be the opposite. They will spend much more time in the reflection of Quran and Sunnah. So according to the field, it, it depends. Uh, and the, the, the last, the, the first question, uh, it, it was about fatawa. So again, you know, I will keep uh, uh, attached to my specific field. It's not about fatawa, it's more about guidelines and teachings because also fatawa uh, means to have authority uh, and it's very tricky. It's based on a specific context and it has to be done by specific people. If not, it's not accepted. So if you want to give a fatwa, for instance, even you may have a right, you may know, uh, you may found the solution and Allah may be pleased with your choice, but if you don't have the authority, then it, your fatwa is worthless. And it's more about the education. I, that's my own perception here, what I'm, I'm trying to say. But especially in the field of humanitarian and social work, it doesn't make sense to, to make fatwa. It's more about uh, what I call guidelines, Islamic guidelines, Islamic teachings about one specific subject. It's not about the halal, haram. Of course, they are haram. And mo mostly it's well known and halal is well known. But the way to do things to lead to, to social change in society often is not black and white and it evolves uh, within the context. But I, should, I wouldn't use the term fatwa with, within this uh, approach, but uh, you may disagree and uh, maybe I'm, I'm wrong. And again, I just speak about this specific area of the, our uh, humanitarian, uh, social, uh, and uh, all these human science uh, related uh, areas. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Yahya, for your response. Uh, I think I would like to open for uh, our participants. If you would like to ask questions to Dr. Yahya, I think you can ask uh, in you know your question in in English or in France or in Arabic. Dr. Yahya speaks Arabic very well. Or maybe he can speak Malay. I'm not sure about it. Yes. <laughs> not yet. So I just would like to open for a maybe last round for a question and answer session before we wrap up for tonight. Be if you are in the Zoom session, you can uh, you know unmute your mic and just ask Dr. Yahya. Okay. Okay. If we ha we don't have any further question, I would I I have some announcements to be made uh, for the viewers and our participants. Uh, I would like to share my screen. Uh, actually, Dr. Yahya is uh, in Malaysia right now. He is visiting Malaysia. And inshallah, tomorrow we will be having another session with Dr. Yahya in person uh, in, at the CNP Coffee Company uh, in Bandar Baru Bangi, session one, Bandar Baru Bangi, uh, to discuss on a very pertinent topic of how Muslims may preserve their faith in facing the challenge of post-modernism and relativism. I think this is also uh, a, a topic that uh, I think uh, being uh, you know, deal with uh, being by a uh, deal by Dr. Yahya. I think he is uh, 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 interacting with Muslims all over the, the world, in Europe, in America, in Latin America, in the Arab world, and in Nusantara. So he has the, you know, the, the holistic picture of how Muslim is, you know, interacting with this challenge of, you know, relativism and postmodernism uh, trends. So, uh, you know, uh, grab this opportunity to be with us uh, tomorrow night to interact with our speaker, Dr. Yahya. Uh, I think uh, tomorrow will be the last day, Dr. Yahya, in Malaysia for this time. So, I would like to invite uh, all of you to be with us today in uh, uh, CNP Coffee Con Company uh, tomorrow night. Uh, another uh, announcement is that you can. Uh, buy uh, or purchase uh, the new work by, uh, by Prof. Jasir Kaunda. 
uh, uh, from Ilham Book, uh, we have uh, posted uh, the link uh, in uh, the uh, FB uh, live uh, chat uh, chat session, uh, comment section. If you like to purchase, you can you know go to the link. Uh, so, I think we have come to the end. Uh, we have come to the end of our session tonight. I would like to thank everybody for your time uh, spending with, with us to discuss on this uh, very important topic. I think this is very important Dr. Haya, for us to build a new uh, research culture uh, in the Muslim world, among the Muslim researchers, so that we have a very uh, credible and very solid uh, methodology uh, to conduct uh, an Islamic-based uh, research. Mm -hmm. So maybe I would like uh, to invite you for some concluding remarks before we wrap up. Yes, uh, thank you, Dr. Badri. Jazakallah khair. And uh, I will say, to conclude, I will say that this, this process um, should be started for, uh, by each of us, by each of the, the Muslims who have interest and who trust in this methodology, even if we think it, it requires uh, a lot of skills. We are all the same. We are all brothers and sisters, and every of, of us have something to, to, to give and to, to do according to our field of interest, according to uh, our field of expertise. And we shouldn't be ashamed or afraid to start from something. It's better to start from something small and then we build on, on it. And as long as we do something, there's barakah, inshallah. So that's my message to, to myself and to the brothers and sisters here. And uh, I was very happy to be with you. And uh, thanks all for welcoming me to Malaysia also. Jazakallah khair. Jazakallah khair. So thank you very much, everybody. Thank you very much, Dr. Yahya. So I think uh, it was a very fruitful uh, discussion, very uh, fascinating uh, you know, uh, presentation tonight. So until we meet again, um, maybe tomorrow, inshallah, if you have time, you can join us tomorrow. So with that, uh, I end this session uh, with Wabillahi Taufiq wa Hidayah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.